Hojo san is in Iowa this morning uh, at Yumanji in Dorchester for Hosenchiki, a Shuso ceremony, as we did here a few weeks ago. So I'll be offering a few, few words today. Um, you may be wondering why there is no apparent walking retreat happening today. Uh, at about 9 or 9.30 last night, the last of the people who signed up canceled. <laughs> Everyone had canceled up to that point. Finally, you know, 9.30 last night, <laughs> the last of them canceled. So no walking retreat today. And given the weather, maybe that's just as well. <laughs> Probably it wouldn't have happened anyway. Uh, but you'll remember that usually on days when we have a walking retreat, the Dharma talk has something to do with walking. Which your son's been talking about walking as a practice. So since we're not doing a walking retreat today, we'll talk about something else. <laughs> we'll save walking for another day. Um, you may recall that when I do Dharma talks, I like to talk about a particular text. Um, in Dogen Zenji's Shobogenzo, there's a chapter called 108 Gates of Dharma Illumination. And that's typically what I talk about because it's a really interesting text and I'm kind of doing some work on it, going through it gate by gate. Uh, this text is mostly a long quote from another text called the Sutra of Collected Past Deeds of the Buddha. And Dogen sort of lifted this piece of text wholesale and dropped it down to the Shoko Genzo, which says to me he thought this was kind of an important text. So it seems to me to be worth talking about. So, so far, here and in other places, I've talked about the first four gates, which are right belief, pure mind, delight, and love and cheerfulness. So now the text uh, takes not a turn, but it starts to talk about a group of things. Um, it, talks, it starts to talk about uh, something we can call the three behaviors, Japanese sango, so body, speech, and thought, right? So the next three gates, five, six, and seven, are body, speech, and thought. So the fifth gate is right conduct of the actions of the body is a gate of Dharma illumination, for with it the three forms of behavior are pure. So these three forms of behavior are actions of body, speech, and thought. Um, clearly, these are an important group. Why? Because these are the three places where we create karma, with the body, with the speech, and with the mind. So this verse that I've asked Iris to write on the board is probably familiar as the verse of repentance. So to begin with, I'd like for us just to chant this together. familiar if you've just been, for instance, to our Jukai ceremony where Iris uh, received her Raksu and four other people did as well. This is part of that ceremony. It's actually something um, in a standard Soto Shu service that we chant every day. So we begin you know, the morning service every day by taking responsibility for uh, our karmic deeds. Um, it's this sticky kind of knotted up karma that comes from the things we do with body, speech, and mind. So a lot of this stuff happens without our necessarily paying attention. Um, of course, we have habituated thinking. We have uh, patterns of behavior. We have things that we do without really consciously intending to do these things. Um, it's just patterns we've developed, things that happen kind of without our volition. Nevertheless, we have to take responsibility for that because we're the ones creating that karma. So we can, instead of beating ourselves up for it, we can simply acknowledge the fact that we have uh, th these karmic patterns, uh, and we can vow in this minute, and the next minute, and the next minute, to do something else, or to do something skillful, or to at least uh, try to pay attention to what's arising, so that the actions we take with body, speech, and mind can 
in the best circumstances create harmony, create wholesomeness, and in, at least <laughs> we can try to minimize uh, whatever negative impact we may be having. So proper behavior with the body, according to this dharmity, means that all three of these things, body, speech, and mind, uh, are without defilement. So uh, the, the gate, the, the section that I read about the gate says that all of these things are pure, body, speech, and mind are pure. Pure means they're without defilement. So when we create karma, that process starts with our thoughts, right? We have some deluded thought that arises, which arises because we're um, ignorant or forgetful about the true nature of reality, right? So something happens in the mind. We think we need to get something, we think we need to escape from something we don't like, um, because we don't understand that there, or, or we forget, that there is really no separation between ourselves and others, or between ourselves and the objects of mind. So based on that deluded thought, there's the thought, based on that deluded thought, next we may engage in some kind of less than ideal speech, some kind of harmful speech. We may say something, we may get angry, we may say something which is unkind, or is not entirely true, um, something designed to get something for ourselves, perhaps at the expense of somebody else. That harmful speech then, so now we've got thought, we've got speech, that harmful speech can escalate perhaps into harmful action. Uh, maybe that conflict escalates from just words to some kind of physical violence. Maybe I tell a lie and then I have to take a lot of steps following that to cover up that lie or to maintain that lie, right? So we see how this really starts with a thought, can move to speech, can move to body. That sort of pattern, that sort of escalation, this whole thing starts to spiral, right? We get suffering, which leads to more suffering. We get creation of more harmful karma for ourselves and for other beings. Dogen says, it is only due to a lack of heart for the way and a lack of skill in handling their daily conduct that people become vainly tied to fame and gain. So simply by not paying attention to what we do with this body, we perpetuate our suffering, we perhaps perpetuate the suffering of others, and we tie ourselves to samsara. You know, here's samsara again. So at the root of this whole process is intention, or volition. Uh, Sanskrit word is chetana. This intention is what bridges the gap between this really subtle, really deeply held craving or aversion or delusion or something, um, and actually carrying out some action to get that thing or to avoid that thing. Uh, so it's the bridge, right? So maybe I see you have a piece of cherry pie. I want that piece of cherry pie because I love me some cherry pie. <laughs> cherry pie is my favorite. So if you've got cherry pie, I want the cherry pie. Based on that craving, at some level, I have some intention to do something about getting that pie. <laughs> Maybe I decide to tell you that Hojo-san wants to see you in his study. <laughs> and as soon as you leave the room, I get the pie. I eat the pie. I help myself. <laughs> to your pie. So maybe some argument happens when you come back and find out what I did, right? And this thing goes on and on and on and on. Who knows what happens next? That small internal personal craving has now become some kind of harmful action with the body. And there's some consequences for me and for you and for other people. So we see how this happens, right? I mean, it happens all the time. And if we're not paying attention, here it is again, here it is again, here it is again. These very um, subtle, kind of habituated things happen in the mind, and before we know it, there's some bodily action there, which creates some kind of karma. I think one of the things that keeps us from acting always on this kind of impulse uh, is a set of moral codes or a set of ethics. Uh, certainly in our practice we have these things. Uh, the elements of the Eightfold Path for, form these three groupings, as you probably know. Uh, we have prajna, which is wisdom, we have shila, which is ethics, and we have samadhi, which is concentration. So the eight elements on that path fall into these three groups. So here's this entire group about ethics. It's about skillful action. What do we do with this body? So under shila, or ethics, we find right speech, right action, and right livelihood. So in the early teachings, right action was mainly about not killing, not stealing, not engaging in some kind of sexual misconduct. As long as we avoided doing those things, that was the kind of thrust of the thinking about 
right action. Right action was about not using the body to break precepts. So, of course, not harming others with our own delusion-based conduct uh, is a good thing, but we're also uh, saving ourselves from harm. So, one potential outcome of our unwholesome action for ourselves is that we're setting up these kind of karmic patterns. As soon as we break a precept with the body, as soon as we allow the body to engage in some kind of wholesome action, we are predisposed, perhaps, to do it again. I mean, this is just, we know this about ourselves, right? This is just our human condition. We can build these harmful habits where unskillful action becomes the default either because we're not paying attention or because it's what we're used to doing or somehow in the past that unskillful action brought us some kind of short-term reward. If I steal once, it's easier to steal again. If I steal that cherry pie from you once, it's easier for me to do it again. If I cheat on my partner once, it's easier for me to cheat again. Right? We build up these predispositions. It's harder to break a long-standing chain of behavior, a long-standing chain of sort of improper conduct, if you will. Um, even when we see that process happening, we can see ourselves going over that cliff, we know what's going to happen. Somehow, because this is a long-standing pattern of unwholesomeness, it's, it's hard to break. The bonds of attachment are hard to break, as we say. So perhaps it's better, if we can, to keep ourselves from taking that first step, from forming that unwholesome pattern of behavior in the first place. So this body is the ground of our practice, it's the ground of our life, right? There is nowhere else we can practice, there's nowhere else we can live. This body is really important in our practice. It's not that we need to somehow escape from the body, or to suppress the body, or somehow minimize the importance of the body. This is our human form. So we have to pay attention to it and to practice with it. And if we do this in a skillful way, the body is our partner in practice. It's not something we struggle with, even though it has some needs, <laughs> some impulses. Um, but it can really become quite a powerful ground of our practice. And the Fukanza Zengi Dogen says, you've gained the pivotal opportunity of human form. Do not pass your days and nights in vain. So this body is something that's important. Gaining this form is a pivotal opportunity. We have a choice. What direction are we going to go? We can either make wholesome choices with this body that lead to awakening, lead to ameliorating suffering, lead to good things in this world, or we can make a choice to do something unwholesome with this body that leads to additional suffering, leads to something unwholesome in the world, leads to more delusion. So what we can see that what we do with this body is the last chance to head off unskillfulness. If you watch this chain of arising, you know, here's the thought, maybe we say something, then we do something. The body is sort of the last chance to head that off before it spills out onto other people. These deluded thoughts arise because we're human beings and this is our nature. But if we don't turn them into harmful speech, we don't turn them into harmful action, we don't spill them onto other people, uh, they can kind of remain our own delusion, which is not optimal, <laughs> but it could be worse, right? <laughs> so this right conduct of the body, I, I think of it as it kind of can serve as a fire, firewall, right? Um, sort of keeping our delusion from leaking out, <laughs> spilling out uh, quite so powerfully, quite so strongly, and, and with such immediate impact into the world. So in this way, the actions of body, speech, and mind don't result in our creating so much karma, or so much negative karma. And in this way, the three behaviors are pure. Right? But avoiding unwholesome action is only one side of this gate, right? Gates swing. <laughs> so this, not doing unwholesome things with this body is only one piece of that. The other piece of that is what do we choose to do positively? As bodhisattvas, we know we need to cultivate wholesome action in the world. It's not enough simply to not do bad. Uh, we also have to actively seek to do something good, something wholesome. So because this body is the ground of our practice, it can really play quite a positive role in, in our own awakening, in encouraging, encouraging the awakening of other people, and alleviating suffering for ourselves and all beings. When we keep the precepts, 
whether we do that, whether we've made some kind of formal public commitment or it's just something which is about our personal practice, when we keep those precepts, we are much less of a threat, perhaps no threat at all, to ourselves and to other beings. Or to anybody's life or property or, or well-being, right? So keeping the precepts and sort of engaging in right conduct is a way to build trust and build security and build respect whether that's within a sangha, an identifiable sangha like ours, or just with whoever we're interacting with in the world, whether that's people in the office, people in our family, people in the grocery line. We have many, many opportunities to, to be no threat and to encourage wholesomeness. So Buddhist ethics are about making a commitment both to self-restraint and to building harmony. So we have, we can pay attention to what's happening here, sort of personally, privately, can we keep ourselves from taking an unskillful action? And also, can we encourage, build, foster harmony outside of ourselves? Of course, there's no outside, right? But provisionally, outside of ourselves. So this gate swings two ways. So we can restrain the self, we can foster some harmony. So we've talked about heading off kind of the negative karma, uh, what do we do to actually create with this body some positive conditions? Our Dharma great-grandfather Koto Sawaki said, since all things are the contents of the self, we should conduct ourselves carefully considering other people's feelings. That's not my water. <laughs> That'd be interesting. Mistake with the body right there. So since all things are the contents of the self, we should conduct ourselves carefully considering other people's feelings. So since there's no real separation between ourselves and all beings, taking care of others, or at least not harming others, benefits ourselves, because it's all one unified reality, right? So our appropriate conduct arises from both wisdom and compassion. We clearly see the true nature of reality. We truly, clearly, directly understand that there is no separation. Uh, that there is only this one unified reality. And also, then, we have the compassion to aspire to this kind of well-being for everyone. So based on this non-duality, which is about wisdom, we have this compassion arises, which means we want the best for everybody. We want to ameliorate suffering in the world. So we need both wisdom and compassion to have right conduct with this body. So if all the things are the contents of the self, like Koto Sawaki says, then all our actions are really part of our effort at right conduct. There is no action we take in the day which is not part of this conduct, this practice of right conduct, because there's no dividing line. At what point are we not practicing? You know? At what point are we not uh, working on awakening? At what point are we not encouraging the arising of compassion, which leads to well-being for everybody? So if all things are the contents of the self, then there's no end. So when Uchiyama Roshi wrote his book about the Tenzo Kyokun, you know, he, we have some translations of it upstairs, he, he wrote this book which included the Tenzo Kyokun but also had his commentary. So the Tenzo Kyokun is about food practice, or at least it appears to be about food practice. How do we cook? How do we serve? Uh, how do we conduct ourselves in the kitchen? Uh, what is food practice about? It's instructions for somebody who's cooking in a temple, cooking for the monks. So when he wrote this book about the Tenzo Kyokun, he called it Finse Ryori no Hon, which means how to cook your life. And we think that's kind of an odd phrase, how to cook your life. But so this word Ryori, these days in modern Japanese, is about cooking. So Ryori Suru is to literally do cooking. But before that, this word has a long history, and before that it was not just about cooking. It actually referred to generally administration or management managing stuff. So it's interesting that he uses that in the title of his book. So how to cook your life is really about how do you manage yourself? How do you manage your affairs? How do you conduct yourself just in the world? So although this book seems to be about food practice, we can apply what it says to everything we're doing. Because a lot of this book is about how do we take care of ingredients? How do we think about the people for whom we're cooking? I mean, all of these are broadly applicable lessons. But he uses a, a phrase like how to cook your life, how to manage yourself. There is no part of what we do in a day that's not about right conduct. So in all our activities, 
not just in the zendo, we're engaged in this practice. This doesn't mean we have to be stiff and joyless. In right conduct can sound like you have to do things in a regimented way. It's not what this teaching is about at all. You know, There are times where that kind of behavior is appropriate. There are times where it's not appropriate. You don't do that with toddlers, right? I mean, you don't do that with your dog. There are times where we need to be formal, but that's not all the time. So our, our challenge is how do we make a choice? <laughs> how do we know how to be appropriate? So it just means that as bodhisattvas, our actions are always, always aimed at creating some kind of harmony, restoring some kind of wholeness, or oneness, or unity, or something like that. Hoja Sun would say, becoming one piece. Have you heard him say this? Yeah. Practice is about becoming one piece. Seamless. Pardon me? Seamless, indeed. So things can appear to be fragmented. We can, we can fool ourselves into thinking there's some separation. But then when we really see clearly, we see non-duality, we become one piece. It's a very helpful phrase. So when we recite the three refuges, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, uh, and we get to Sangha, we say, I take refuge in the Sangha, vowing with all sentient beings, bringing harmony to all completely without hindrance. Maybe you've chanted this many times. This is also often part of the standard morning service. So here we are taking refuge in this group of practitioners, vowing to bring harmony to, to all completely without hindrance. What is that but right conduct? That's what that's about. So we're practicing to cut through the delusion that causes us to create this karma or create this wholesome karma with body, speech, and mind. But we're doing it not just for ourselves. We're doing this for all beings. So we get some immediate or maybe not so immediate benefit from this and that we don't create suffering for ourselves. But we're not just doing this right conduct practice for ourselves. We're doing it for all beings, which is why this becomes a gate of dharma illumination. And actually, it's not, our teachers, many of our teachers say, it's not enough just to try to do good uh, ourselves. Both the Buddha and even Dogen said, we need as part of our practice to be encouraging other people to engage in right conduct. That doesn't mean we're coming behind them with you know, a whip and saying, get in line. But it does mean we can foster some good conditions for people to engage in right conduct, to keep precepts, to take wholesome action. So it, the responsibility is not just here. It starts here. Responsibility is not just here. We also have to look around and say, what am I doing to help other people to practice? And that's maybe within a sangha, and it's also outside the sangha. How do we help our families? How do we help our neighborhood? How do we help our schools or our classrooms or the world? I mean, goodness knows if we can reduce some suffering in these days. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> so um, Buddha and Dogen and many of our teachers say this is part of our practice. Buddha says it's not enough just for us not to kill or just for us not to steal. Uh, we have to encourage other people not to kill and not to steal. It's also not enough uh, to encourage others toward right conduct and then not engage in right conduct ourselves. So it's not enough for me to say to you, don't kill, don't steal, don't engage in sexual misconduct, and then I go off and do whatever I want. Not okay. <laughs> not okay. I've got to walk the talk. So it starts here, you know. Right conduct starts here. With any luck, people see our right conduct and become influenced or become inspired. They may not know why. Maybe it's happened in your practice that somebody comes to you and says, boy, since you started doing this Zen practice thing, gosh, you seem to be different, and I want to be like you. What are you doing? This seems to be working. You seem to be calmer. You seem to be uh, more grounded. What are you doing? I don't know if that's happened to you. It happened to me. I said, wow, this stuff works. So how can we in our practice take that off the cushion and encourage that in other people? It doesn't mean everyone we know is going to sit zazen. It does mean people we know can make good choices. And we can perhaps help them to do that in a variety of ways. So Dogen had a lot to say, actually, about how we should help others with their conduct. Because, of course, he wrote a lot of sort of monastic regulations and all of that kind of thing. So some of that was quite formal. But some of his writing was, was pretty informal. He was writing in some cases in colloquial Japanese, and he was really sort of writing a checklist or a memo list or something for new monks coming in to the monastery. How do you get started? How do you look around and decide what to do? So he said, you know, for instance, we should not be supporting misconduct of other people, whether that's sort of materially, like somebody's going to do some bad action and we're going to help them, or even we shouldn't sort of stand back and be amused by that or sympathetic in some way to that, you know, we could say, well, I'm not doing what they're doing, but gosh, isn't it funny what they're doing? 
or isn't it you know interesting what they're doing? Um, okay, but th that's in some ways we're not engaging in right conduct ourselves by eating and abetting and sympathizing with people or maybe doing something which is less than optimal. Um, but at the same time, he says, we can't condemn people for making mistakes. So while we maybe shouldn't be encouraging them, going along with them, being amused by it, we also shouldn't be condemning them for that because we all make mistakes, we need to practice. Um, you know, this human condition is such that we're not perfect. So we need to have some compassion for people and maybe help find a better way to do something or a way to make a different choice. Um, rather than getting involved with this kind of speaking of the faults of others, right, or comparing ourselves with others, we just need to engage in our own practice. So to the degree that we can help other people, good, but also we need not to forget, what's this body doing? <laughs> what's this body speech and thought doing? You know, job one is what's happening here. Um, so Dogen says, even though the Buddha had brought his own faults under control, he had no feeling of loathing for those who were not. So we can emulate the Buddha in this way. He'd kind of figured it out. But of course, he was surrounded by flawed human beings, as we all are. And he didn't condemn them for that. He just helped them to practice, which is what we can do. If we can do that without feeling superior, that's kind of a trap, right? I'm going to give you my practice because my I'm better. I've got this thing. And I'm going to, you know, it, it's working better in my life than your life is working, so I'm going to somehow impose this on you. Of course not. Of course not. Dogen also says, by the way, that someone who sees a quarrel breaking out or a fight or an argument breaking out and doesn't do anything to stop it is just as much at fault as the people who are engaged in the quarrel. That's a kind of a scary thing, isn't it? We don't always want to step in to somebody, somebody else's argument. That's a whole exercise of skillful action because, of course, there's more than one way to stop that quarrel. So our challenge as bodhisattvas is, boy, we need to assess that situation and figure out what the skillful action of body is. And there is no one right answer. People having a verbal argument is one thing. People with knives and guns is another. How do we take bodhisattva action in that case? No simple answer to that. But according to Dogen, we can't ignore it. We can't walk away. And we know as bodhisattvas, we can't walk away from that kind of suffering. What do we do? Not easy. So encouraging others toward right conduct is not about simply saying to people, this is right, this is wrong. Right? We don't want to put ourselves in that position. If we do that a lot, people stop listening, right? <laughs> there comes a time where you have to just back up and say, you know, simply saying, this is right, this is wrong, isn't working. We also, I think, have to just embody this kind of right conduct, embody this kind of good behavior as an example or as an inspiration perhaps to other people. We can probably all think of somebody we know in our lives that somehow, at some point, was a model for us, an inspiration for us about right conduct. The way that person handled a conflict, the way that person handled a difficult situation, the way that person moved through the world, leaving some kind of trail of wholesomeness, or even just good cheer. Those kinds of examples are really helpful in our practice, which is why Sangha is so important. So in addition to just modeling, embodying, carrying this kind of right conduct, we also have to be clear about our intention. Because it's one thing to take a certain posture, and I don't use the term meaning zazen, <laughs> but to, to um, create a certain image of ourselves in the world based on what we do and how other people may see what we do. And that can be driven by delusion, right? That doesn't necessarily indicate that our intentions are completely clean. So we can learn to copy what other people do, but we have to search our own intention, our own motivation, right? Because as we saw a few minutes ago, that intention, that volition, is the bridge between what's going on and, you know, and what kind of action I take you know, to make that happen. So if our supposed right conduct is actually driven by delusion, if we're actually doing those actions in order to get something, to escape something because of some kind of misunderstanding about the nature of the world, then of course that right conduct is not really pure. Body, speech, and mind are not really pure in that case, or at least 100% pure. But of course the trap there is we can think, well, if my action isn't 100% or my motivation isn't 100% pure, should I not take that good action? Well, that's another whole conversation, <laughs> right? Because as human beings, 
it's very difficult for us ever to be 100% pure in body, speech, and mind. Does that mean we shouldn't take good bodhisattva action? No, but we do need to be aware. What's our right conduct based on? Is it based on the arising of wisdom and compassion, or is it based on, I want people to think I'm a good practitioner? I want people to think I'm a great bodhisattva? Whatever's arising for us in that moment. In the Shobogenzo's Wimonki, Dogen says, nowadays some people seem to have renounced the world and left their families. Nevertheless, when examining their conduct, there are those who are not yet true home leavers. As a home leaver, first of all, we must depart from our ego-centered self, as well as from desire for fame and profit. Unless we become free from these, even if we urgently practice the way as if extinguishing a fire enveloping our head, or devote ourselves to diligent practice as hard as people who cut off their hands or legs, it will only be a meaningless trouble that has nothing to do with renunciation. So here, of course, he's talking to monks. But this applies to all of us in our practice. What he says really applies uh, to all of us as we go forward. We can seem to be exhibiting some right conduct, whether that's in Zendo or anywhere else. But what's really going on here? What's really going on here? We can look like the best monks in the world, but what's really driving that? We have to be careful. It's just easy to slip. So Hojo-san has written about this, when we compete with other people and we want to consider we are better than others, or we want other people to consider us as superior or we want other people to consider us as superior practitioners to them, or if we study Buddhist teachings to show others that we have better knowledge, our motivation is not genuine bodhi mind. We are moved by our ego-centered desire to be winners in the competition. This is the way we ourselves create samsara within our own Buddhist practice. So something we take on that appears to be very wholesome and that we actually want to be very, very wholesome. There can be this little something happening, right? I've certainly fallen into this trap in my own practice, and perhaps you have too. Uh, early on in my practice, uh, I was always looking for the one true way. This is, this is the exact opposite of, you know, in, the, um, in the, the mind of the beginner, all things are possible, and in the mind of the expert, there are only a few possibilities. For me, it was just the opposite. I was looking for the one true way. And maybe it's because I was scared of all the possibility. I don't know, but I thought there has to be one perfect, traditional, Japanese Soto Zen way to do everything, and by gosh, that must be the best. Now, at the time, I was practicing the song, which had very little traditional practice, so I was in a real conundrum. Probably, this need for the one true way was exacerbated <laughs> by the lack of traditional practice around me. I thought, there has to be something better. This can't possibly be all. This can't possibly be good enough. There has to be something better. But there's, I'm sure that in Japan, everyone does things the same way, and that must be right. That must be the one way, right? So, you know, anyone who somehow didn't exhibit that kind of form or knowledge or something, couldn't possibly be a highly developed practitioner, couldn't possibly have my level of commitment to practice. You know. <laughs> so imagine my dismay when I got to Japan and found there was no one true way. <laughs> Even the two head temples do things differently. It's like a dialect. You can tell where somebody trained. Actually, based on their bodily conduct, you can tell where they trained because different places do things differently. And of course, that was tremendously disappointing to me. But every temple in Japan, just like every temple in the West, has to adapt to conditions, right? I mean, you know, you're dealing with a certain group of people, you're practicing in a certain kind of space, you have certain kind of resources, the needs of your constituents are a certain way, so of course everybody has to adapt. Well, I was too inflexible, and you know, I was very young in my practice, and I was too inflexible to accept that. You know, I thought there has to be we have to move a certain way, we have to handle things a certain way, that can be the only possible right way. So, when I got to Japan, and I was, well, the first time I went to Japan to practice, I was a lay person, so I was not like training, but still, it became immediately clear to me that this was my own delusion. This was you know, clearly an idea which was my own creation. This had never existed, <laughs> it was never going to exist. But gosh, I was scared. I was really disappointed, I was scared. I thought, who am I now? You know, what do I do now? What do I grab onto now? If there's no one true way in my practice, what do I do? And the corollary of that is, my gosh, all those people that were just sitting without any traditional practice weren't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now what? You know, because you want to be right. You want someone else to be wrong. You want to be better, right? Even when it comes to practice, we have this competition. You think this is a pure space, but, you know, we're deluded human beings. Oh my gosh, that means that I can't put them down. I can't say, well, I'm better than you, because they weren't wrong. Here was the wrong, right? So this yardstick I had that I'd been using to measure right conduct was completely gone. I had nothing to put in its place. Not only that, I'd been foolish to even think there was a yardstick. So, I mean, I was like, well, <laughs> on all counts, it was a big kind of wake-up call for me. You know, it's like, you, yes, you can't practice like that. So, you know, if we're practicing kind of sincerely, doing our best moment by moment, that's a much more effective kind of yardstick if we need one, which we don't then, you know, there's one true way. So it was kind of a, uh, a real learning experience to be in right conduct. I had been not at all exhibiting right conduct, even when I thought I was trying to do things in a very proper way. You know, if my corners are sharper than yours, if my elbows are higher, whatever that meant. You know, I hold my orioki higher than you. You know, you think, well, that's right conduct. Well, okay, in some circumstances, it's really important to be precise. If we're doing a really high status ceremony somewhere in a, in a huge train. Yeah, that stuff might be important because that's part of the practice in that moment. Do we need to be like that all the time? Probably not. So what exactly is right conduct and how do we know what that is? There's no yardstick. Well, now what do I do? Welcome to practice. <laughs> Welcome to practice. So if we're really, you know, practicing sincerely and our conduct is based on awakening, and on wisdom, and on compassion, and bodhi mind, and all of these things that arise in our practice, then, you know, rather, rather than basing that on, I need to get something, I need to look like something, um, I even need my own personal enlightenment, whatever that means, instead we're just sincerely going forward, step by step by step by step. That's when what we do with this body becomes a manifestation of our Buddha nature. That's when there's no gap, and everything sort of falls off, and that's when this right conduct is really a manifestation of true self. And we're not getting in the way. Our stuff doesn't get in the way. There's no difference in that moment between practice and right conduct. There's no difference anyway, right? But we understand in some way. There's no difference between practice and right conduct. So Zazen, of course, is a body practice. We take a particular posture. It's a particular kind of conduct, something that we do with the body. That's not the only right conduct in our practice. And we can certainly see there are multiple ways to do zazen. There's no even one true way about zazen, right? I mean, I sit on a bench, some of you sit on cushions, some people are in chairs. Our bodies are different, you know? Just the way we hold ourselves is different. I don't breathe at the same rate that you do. What's deluded thoughts coming up in zazen in my mind are not yours. I hope not. <laughs> I don't want yours either, by the way. So this right conduct is zazen, but it's everything else. It's how do we walk through the world. Dogen says, all Buddhas, without exception, fully practice dignified conduct. This practice is practice Buddha. Sharing one corner of the Buddha's dignified conduct is done together with the entire universe, the great earth, and with the entire coming and going of life and death. So here we are, right conduct, right in the middle of all this. This is nothing other than the dignified conduct of the oneness of practice and Buddha. So it's worth our attention, isn't it? It's worth our effort. It's worth our time to think about right conduct. Because right in the middle of right conduct, Buddha is there. Buddha nature is there. Awakening is there. All of our actions become practice. All of our actions are embodiments of Buddha nature. So if we think somehow that we come into the Zendo and here's where we practice and then we go out there and all bets are off, no. And actually, I take that as kind of encouraging. That's not, that doesn't say to me, well, I need all the time to be worried about practice as I walk through my day. That says to me, I have an opportunity in every single moment to practice. You know, if we're committed to this practice, whether it's a public commitment or just a sort of a personal commitment, we, we have an opportunity to practice every waking moment and sleeping to if we want. <laughs> right? We always have an opportunity. Walking from the car to the building is an opportunity to walk with practice, to walk with mindfulness, you know? Cooking a meal, taking care of our children, whatever we're doing, 
is an opportunity to practice. All of that is about right conduct because we're moving this body, we're in this body, we can't escape the body. This is where we practice. What are we doing with the body? Are we taking care of the body? Are we using the body to create wholesomeness, to become one piece? So this right conduct isn't only a manifestation of Buddha nature, it also prepares the ground, if you will, uh, for this kind of continuing wholesomeness. So what we do with this body influences how settled we can be. So if we're going out and breaking a lot of precepts, we're not settled, right? Because if we break precepts, we create some suffering for ourselves. If I steal something, that's not a stable position, because i got to know. Whether I feel it immediately or later on, there's some imbalance there, because I've done something which is inappropriate, I've created some suffering, it's going to come back to me somehow. Whether that's because I've set up a pattern for, for continuing on wholesomeness, I've broken a relationship with somebody, which is going to come back to me, right? So simply engaging in right conduct is not only about manifesting this Buddha nature, it also creates the ground for continuing wholesomeness. So again, we have these two things happening. Right? So how do we go around and around and around <laughs> and figure out sort of what that next wholesome step is? This is our practice. It's just moment by moment. Um, when we can settle down, we keep precepts, um, we create some kind of stability. We create a safe atmosphere for ourselves and for all beings. We can open the hand of thought. We can start to see the nature of our delusions. We see them arise. We see what they are. We don't get stuck. We begin to loosen this grip of craving and aversion and these things that pull us around and pull us perhaps toward conduct which isn't so right. We're much better able to move skillfully through the world. That skillful action perpetuates trust, perpetuates stability. So now we have, we've started a cycle of something wholesome, um, something helpful, enabling further practice. So, you know, we begin to practice we decide to keep precepts. Keeping those precepts enables our practice, which enables us to keep precepts, right? So we have precepts that kind of say, well, try to avoid doing this and this and this, until such time in our practice as we see clearly enough that the urge to do those things doesn't arise anymore. So it's all a spiral. It's all a circle. Dogen says, in the great truth of the Buddhist patriarchs, there is always pure conduct and observance of the precepts above which there is nothing. It continues in an unbroken cycle so that there is not the slightest interval between establishment of the mind training, bodhi, and nirvana. Conduct and observance is a continuing cycle. Right? So we engage in wholesome activity which enables further wholesome activity. Rather than engaging in unwholesome activity which sets up this pattern of breaking more precepts and creating more suffering. So this right conduct is both an embodiment of awakening and an opportunity to create some conditions for awakening. And in that way, it is a gate of Dharma illumination. So we both have the Dharma being illuminated. We have some insight into the nature of Dharma, reality, truth, true self, Buddha nature, whatever you want to call that. And we also have the Dharma providing that illumination. So it's this gate that swings two ways. So in the Samantabhadra Sutra, it says, the ocean of all karmic hindrances arises solely from delusive thoughts. If you wish to make repentance, sit in an upright posture and be mindful of the true nature of reality. All faults and evil deeds are like frost and dew. The sun of wisdom enables them to melt away. All right? So, if we wish to make repentance, sit in an upright posture, be mindful of the true nature of reality. Yes, that's zazen, but it's also the upright posture we take when we go out the door and we interact with people and we go about our daily work, our daily lives. And somehow, uh, taking that posture and being mindful of reality, our the wisdom that we that arises from that, the wisdom and compassion that arise from that, keep us from perpetuating unwholesome patterns. So here we are, we've come all the way back around to this chant, right? Where we started with the repentance first. So once we see clearly what reality is really about, we can stop making mistakes, we can stop creating harmful karma. We can engage in right conduct of the body, and this right conduct of the body then becomes this gate of dharma illumination. So I don't know what time it is because I didn't put a clock in front of me, but what would you like to say about any of that or whatever's percolating in your bodies and minds, body, speech, and mind, in your practice this morning?
please. Um, one thing that I, you know, I, as far as re repentance goes, and if we had harmful actions and unwholesome actions, and those actions have caused harm to other people, one thing I don't, you know, there's, there's, of course, stopping it and doing something different. Um, one thing I don't ever hear much about in Zen is restitution mm. or making amends to others. I don't know if you can make a comment on that. Sometimes we have some opportunity to make amends. And we can certainly take advantage of that. Um, if I've stolen your cherry pie, I have every opportunity to say, gosh, that wasn't right action. I'm sorry I did that. Maybe I get you another one. <laughs> or get you something you like. Um, and of course that's always helpful because again we're restoring wholeness, we're becoming one piece. I've mended this relationship but I've also taken, uh, I've also acknowledged that I've kind of made a mistake, which is a lot of what this is about, right? We do this repentant verse. One of the translations of this verse instead of now I make complete repentance is now I fully avow. Now I fully acknowledge that I've made some mistake. So, of course, job one in restitution is to say, you know, I, I did something not so good. And that sounds easy, right? But gosh, it's not. Because <laughs> we always want to think what we did was the right thing. Even if somebody points out to me, that wasn't such a good thing. I might argue with that person. Well, sure, I had to do it because da 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 So job one in restitution is I take responsibility for myself. Right? So in that way, that's how we begin it. Once I've taken responsibility for myself, it can be really helpful to think, is there something I can do to, to make amends? Have I created suffering that I can in any way undo? Now that's a huge topic, right? Because we can't live without creating suffering. We can't, live, we can't eat without killing beings. So this is a very deep practice when we think about what is my footprint in the world and what kind of suffering am I creating in the world? What can I do to ameliorate the suffering? Sometimes there's something directly we can do. Sometimes there isn't. Just the fact that you know, we cut down a plant and eat it. Well, we've caused some suffering. What do we do? A lot, there are several opportunities in our practice to work with that stuff. For instance, if I'm engaging in right conduct in the world, and I'm simply trying not to create additional suffering, that may be all I can do to acknowledge that I have a footprint in the world that I have, I, you know, this body needs things. Um, when we do takuhatsu in Japan, the first time I ever did takuhatsu, alms rounds in Japan, it was a really direct experience of how my life is supported by all beings. So I was in a community which was full of people. It was a farming community. These people did not have a ton of money. Some of them didn't give money. They had to give rice. And I could see that, I mean, people were not, you know, poverty-stricken, but they didn't have a lot, which meant if they were giving to me, they were going without something. And I was taking from that. Well, coming from the West, I mean, I wasn't, at the time, I was still had a good job, you know, and, and I had all I needed, and I thought... Here I am, I have all I need, and yet I'm somehow taking this from some family that doesn't have that much, and that's got to be creating some suffering. What it did in that moment was, was make me think, I need, when I eat this rice, I need to make sure that the energy that goes into my body from eating this rice, I'm using in the best possible way. I'm doing the best possible practice, I'm doing the most good I can in the world, because these people have supported me and given me something to allow that to happen. So I can't squander that, I can't waste that. So if I've taken something from somebody, if I take your cherry pie, and somehow I can't go back and say I'm sorry, at least I'd better make sure that what comes out of that, I turn it around. Can something wholesome happen out of that? Can some good, even though the, the start of this thing was not so good, in the end, what can I do to move that toward wholesomeness? And I'm sure we can all think of times in our lives where we've injured somebody, we've made a mistake, and we thought, I can't go back anymore and fix that problem. Sometimes where that hits us the most deeply is somebody dies and we never had a chance to say I'm sorry for what I did or we never had a chance to fix the relationship and we think it's too late now. I should have done something while I could because now I can't. That's the moment we can rededicate ourselves to bodhisattva practice and say I can't in a physical way fix that anymore 
but I can devote myself to practice such that those kinds of actions don't arise going forward. And the way I can honor that person and the way I can honor <clears throat> our relationship is to be wholesome just in all of my other relationships. And in a way, we can think, well, that's kind of cold comfort. On the other hand, we're creating goodness and wholesomeness for a number of beings. So in addition to this relationship, you know, we're, we're fixing our relationships or working on our relationships with all beings. So is there one answer to that? No. Uh, but I think when we think about restitution, one way we can think about that is how can I turn something which began perhaps in unwholesomeness into something more wholesome? And we can perhaps feel a little bit I mean, the idea is not to make ourselves feel better, but we can perhaps reduce our own suffering, or our own paralysis around our mistakes. Gosh, I made a mistake. I can't fix it. I don't know how to go forward from it. How do we go forward from it? Take the next step in a wholesome way. In the next moment, it's a new moment, right? So we are not this bad thing we did. We still have an opportunity in the next moment, which is why we do the verse of repentance. I take responsibility for what I did. And, and usually what happens in the service is the very next thing we do is the bodhisattva vows. Mm -hmm. I've taken responsibility for my evil karmic deeds, and now in this next moment I vow to go forward as a bodhisattva and do the very best I can for people. I acknowledge it. I'm not ignoring it. I'm not avoiding it. I can't change it. What about this one? Does that help at all? Yeah. It's a huge topic. We could talk all day. <laughs> Please. Uh, you spoke about um, like right action not just being within ourselves, but also like going out into the world and mm -hmm. kind of taking responsibility for that as well. Um, I, I feel like I see that very readily in kind of like interpersonal, like our own lives kind of thing. But in kind of a more wide context, like a social context, um, I, I, I feel like that definitely suggests like participation in like movements, protests, what have you, but I feel like a lot of those things can cause a duality. Like they're the ones that have things wrong, we have things right, we must make them right. Absolutely. Um, so could you comment on that? That's a huge pitfall. Right action in terms of social action mm -hmm. and social justice work is actually quite a big topic in Western Zen and Western Buddhism in general. Because as bodhisattvas, some of us, not all of us, but some of us, feel called to go into the community and do something. And for some people that takes the form of protests and sit-ins and you know, writing letters and that kind of thing. And that can be done in appropriate ways. But the trap is, as you say, not to get stuck in this duality that says, I have the right view and they have the wrong view. And I have to turn them, I have to fix them, I have to change them. Maybe that's possible, but maybe it isn't. And does that mean that then our action in the world is somehow not worthwhile? There's no answer to these things. I'm just throwing them out for you. <laughs> because each of us has to make a choice. This is why practice is hard. You know? For some people, they don't feel, you know, who want to affect some change in the world, they may not see that kind of direct action as their path. That doesn't mean that there's nothing they can do, because as we know, simply getting on a cushion every day is a start. And what we have to do anyway. So I'll get to you in a minute. Uh, so, you know, one, one would hope that in our practice, you know, our, our daily activity, whatever arena that's in, whatever form that takes, arises from our zazen, because that's where we come back and say, what is the nature of reality? What's really going on? It's where we can keep ourselves from getting hijacked into making those kind of mistakes where it's a shouting match. You know, my party's right, your party's wrong, or my, you know, point of view is right and yours is wrong. So we can get sucked in, there's no question. So walking that line is a bit tough. Um, but that's the middle way. So our teachings say it's not, our teachings are not that we should uh, crawl in a hole and pull the hole in after us and ignore what's going on out here. Because that's not okay. Because there's suffering in the world. So it's not okay for me to say, well, that suffering isn't my problem. And at the same time, we want to be careful about when we do engage in bodhisattva activity and walk through the world and try to ameliorate suffering, are we creating more suffering? Are we perpetuating suffering? You know, what is the actual skillful action? And it's really not clear. And it's really not easy. So, you know, we have to make an individual choice, moment by moment by moment. What is it, but I mean, ultimately what it comes down to is, what is it to be one piece? What is it to create harmony? What is it to manifest unity? And that's not always obvious. So you're not wrong when you say our practice calls us to do those things. 
And our practice also gives us some guidelines about how do we choose. You wanted to jump in, Allison. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up that question. Thank you too, for your comments. I just wanted to mention um, something that I read the other day that was really helpful to me and was actually right, I think, on this topic. And it was in a magazine that I get called The Sun, S-U-N. And it was an excerpt from an interview that Bell Hooks mm. did back in, I think, maybe around 97. And she was interviewing Pima Chudron, mm. the uh, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. And <clears throat> uh, Pima Chudron said, she mentioned the Bodhisattva vows, I vow to save all beings. And that was because Bell Hooks had said, I'm really an activist against racism and different kinds of social injustice. I really want to end the suffering of racism. And human children said, well, of course, of course we all would like to see that end. But the important thing to me, she said, is that I work with people and myself the way we are now in this present moment. That's all that we can do. And I have an aspiration to end racism, but if I am too goal-oriented goal about this, then I run into trouble because I fall into this trap of duality that you were mentioning, that you also mentioned. That if you say, I'm right and they're wrong and I have to change them, that there's something very aggressive about that. You're, you're kind of splitting yourself off from mm -hmm. other people and not recognizing that we're all in it together and then you have a lot of, you create more difficulty. And the thing that was really striking to me about what Pima Chitron said was, she said, when I'm working with things the way they are in the present moment, I give up all hope that things will change and all fear that they won't change. I give up all hope that things will change and all fear that they won't change. That was a, a kind of frightening uh, statement. <laughs> and then Bell Hooks got kind of upset and said, mm -hmm. well, how can, I, how can I continue working towards ending racism if I give up all hope, you know? And Pima Chidron said, but you know, that's what I believe you have to do. Mm -hmm. We still must work. So anyway, mm -hmm. I'm still kind of struggling with that myself. But That's really interesting. That's really interesting. So I think she makes a very good point when she says we have to work with people as they are right now. Because if we work with our idea of what people are or could be or should be, we're not meeting them where they are, we're not engaging with reality, we're only working with our idea, which may or may not be right. So I have to, if I'm talking with you, I have to talk with you as you are in this minute and not as I hope you'll be next year or as you were when I met you or something else, and, and that's right. But this, this piece about giving up hope is very interesting. And I can see why at first blush you read something like that and you think, yikes! <laughs> you know, does that mean, what does that mean? I mean, does that mean we should, like, there's, there's no prospect for improvement, you know? And I don't think that's what she's saying. I think she's, right, right. you know, and I'm sure you know. Uh, you know, when I read that, I think, well, okay, so if we have hope about something, that's kind of a personal desire. I mean, we can take that as a personal desire. I personally want something to happen. And we can want that for the best of reasons, but that's our own, you know, we need something to happen for this one, maybe. And I think what she's saying is, I'm giving up my personal idea of what, could, should, might happen. I'm engaging with what's happening in this moment and I'm doing this in the most skillful, awake way I can, which doesn't negate my aspiration for the well-being of all beings. Mm -hmm. But it's not a small personal thing we're calling hope. It's that in this moment, which is not separate from all moments anyway, all moments are here, right? So if I'm dealing with you in this moment, I'm, I'm also dealing with you in all other moments, I can give up my personal need for some outcome. And I can mm -hmm. say, that doesn't negate my aspiration you know, for well-being for everybody. 
-hmm. So it's a little bit, you know. So I think what she's trying to help her um, conversation partner back away from is a personal need for something to happen. If I'm really personally invested in an outcome, mm -hmm. that can be good because there's some real energy that can come out of that. You know, you can you work really hard on something you're personally invested in. That in itself is not bad, but there's going to come a point where you're going to hit some barrier mm -hmm. and it's going to be about, and it's going to be caught up with your desire for something. Mm -hmm. Can we do our bodhisattva work in the world without a personal desire for something? And that's a really fine line. You know, and it can, that's where we can get paralyzed and say, well, if I can't do this without a personal desire, should I not be doing it at all? Absolutely not. Do your work in the world, for heaven's sake. You know, fight racism, you bet. But ultimately, watch your mind state. Please. Well, the things that we would like to do, that we'd like to see in the world, and also the things that we vow to do when we say the Bodhisattva vows, I vow to save all beings. Mm. That's the idea, but impossible, right? And yet we vow that. Yes. And we have that as an aspiration. Yes. So, so I guess what I'm wondering is if you think it doesn't matter whether we can achieve it or not, the important thing is having that intent and yeah, I, making a good effort. I would say it's not that it doesn't matter whether or not we achieve it. Okay. If it doesn't matter whether or not we achieve it, then it's probably not worth our aspiration. Okay, so it matters in a larger sense. I think it matters in a larger sense, because yeah. if, it, if the well-being of all beings didn't matter, we wouldn't take the vow. Right. right. Clearly, there's something important about that. What That's I meant a, was, um, sorry to interrupt, what I meant was, uh, oftentimes I think, if I want to do something and I know I'm going to fail, then perhaps I shouldn't even try. Mm -hmm. It's foolish to try. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I imagine there could be things like saving all beings that even though I know I'm doomed to fail because it's an impossible task or maybe I'm not up to the task or whatever, I should still try anyway. Absolutely, so, okay. absolutely. Because, you know, we plant seeds every moment. We don't know where, what the outcome of that is. So if I try to do something and I fail, out in the parking lot right now, I have my tiny wood lathe. And I have it in the parking lot because I live in an apartment, and my neighbors would like throw me out if I was doing that kind of woodworking in my apartment. And I'm a rank beginner, right? I am a rank beginner. And when it's, so I thought, well, I could put my lathe here, and nobody will care much noise and mess and stuff I make. And so, you know, I, the, you might remember there was a big cherry tree. The neighbor's cherry tree fell down and took out our fence. <coughs> And Hoshin's got this thing now hauled to the back of the property. And I said to him, are you going to use this cherry tree or can I experiment on it? He said, no, you can have it. The cherry wood, fabulous. Got out my chainsaw, cut some bowl blanks, chucked this thing up on the lathe. And I thought, I have no idea if this is going to, if I can even do this. I don't know if I can even do this. I've seen plenty of people do it. I know a lot of theory. My practical is pretty limited. I thought, I don't know. If I, I might hurt myself. You know, I might blow something up. I don't, well, okay. So, you know. All yesterday, I was out there having a great time with the wood lathe, making mistakes, catches every 10 minutes. I mean, it's all wobbly, you know. I made a bunch of mistakes. But of course, I learned something, right? And I had a good time. So if I had, if I had gone at that, I'm using a very broad example. If I'd gone at that and said, gee, I think I can't do this, so I'm not going to do it at all, of course, many other side outcomes wouldn't happen. So I think even with something like trying to save all beings, if we're going forward in a healthy way, with our aspiration to save all beings, we've got to be planting some flowers on the roadside, right? Because we're behaving in a certain way, we're, we're conducting ourselves in a certain way, we're creating some other smaller, minor, <laughs> good outcomes, you know? So it's worth going, it's worth taking that path, it's worth having that aspiration. We may or may not, in the end, completely save all beings, although we can have some discussion about what that actually means. Uh, but it's still worth making that aspiration. So can we completely eliminate racism in our lifetime? Probably not. Does that mean we shouldn't try? Probably not. And I mean, I'm not telling you something you don't know. Yeah, we can get discouraged, you bet. There's some, there's some pretty big suffering in the world, you know? But moment by moment by moment by moment, what can we do? Moment by moment, can we engage in right conduct? Can we become one piece? Can we keep ourselves from making additional mistakes? Can we embody good behavior? Can we 
change somebody's thinking just a little bit, all of that's not wasted effort, I think. I don't know. Please. I think sort of tied up in the whole uh, issue also is our, our, we often have a notion of something being permanent. Like yeah. the conditions right now, yeah. you know, there's a sense that, oh, it's fixed, it will never change. Yes. And I think as long as we try to keep in mind that things can change, and mm -hmm. permanence is everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so even even some small thing that we can do, even if we don't see an immediate result. And the other thing about that is I think that enables us, too, to take advantage of opportunity that we didn't create. So it's not like we have to do it all ourselves. You know, if you're working on something and I'm working on something and you opened up an opportunity for me, I need to be awake enough to see that and partner with you or somehow leverage that, you know, so that we can work together on stuff. Because things are changing all the time and we never know. Please, Risa. Um, I... I really like the whole concept of skillful means mm -hmm. and uh, this idea of meeting someone where they are or working with someone where they are. But in reality, <laughs> I find I'm not real skillful. And <laughs> I can get entangled with someone who perhaps you know, where they are right now is actually dangerous to me. And I know as a bodhisattva, I'm not supposed to be thinking about me and worrying about, you know, uh, that something can happen to me that's not going to be good. I'm just supposed to be compassionate and so on. Of course, there's this idea of uh, stupid compassion or foolish compassion. But that, that's a real conundrum for mm -hmm. me. How, mm -hmm. at what point do I withdraw to preserve my, my own benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Without this body and mind, we can't practice. So if there's some threat to this body and mind, it makes an awful lot of sense to withdraw and preserve this so we can go forward. To simply throw away this body and mind, I mean, okay, yeah, the, you know, the Buddha sacrificed himself so animals could eat him and all kinds of things. <laughs> he had some reasons for that. Um, if, if I'm in a threatening situation and I'm worried that some physical harm can come to me, it's probably, the, the smart move there is probably not to stay in that situation and become wounded or injured or killed so that I can't go forward and do my bodhisattva work. You know, it makes sense for me to leave that situation and maybe call for help, maybe find somebody who can deal with this more appropriately, maybe wait for another day, I mean, I don't know. But as you say, there is such a thing as idiot compassion where we think we need to aid and abet people in whatever it is that they're doing in some way that is harmful for them or harmful for us. So I think the Bodhisattva vow is, on the one hand, yes, it's about throwing ourselves into it wholeheartedly and not being terribly concerned about the outcome, but I think we have to look at what's our motivation for being in that circumstance. So if I'm in that circumstance because I want to get something out of it, that's different than I'm in that circumstance purely because I want to aid the well-being of other beings. So I don't think there's anything in our practice that says you have to stay in a dangerous situation because somehow you've given up all um, concern about your, yourself. I don't, you know? I mean, I think there's a balance there. So I would certainly never encourage anybody to become injured or killed or damaged or something out of a sense that, well, I have to stay in this situation because what matters, what happens to me doesn't matter. I don't think we can say what happens to me doesn't matter. I think that comes back to what's my motivation for being in that circumstance, you know? So if I really want that piece of pie, and I'm putting myself in danger to get the piece of pie, it's time for me to think about why do I want this piece of pie that much, <laughs> you know? Um, but if an argument breaks out, and it's incumbent on us as bodhisattvas to try to stop the argument in a safe, sane kind of normal, uh, healthy way, I, I may feel called to do that, to step in in some way, but not at the cost of this body and mind, because then I can't stop the next argument, you know? So I don't think we have to endanger ourselves for that. Does that help a little bit? Mm. I mean, it's a, you know, it, for each of us, it's a line, you know, it's something we decide moment by moment by moment. Um, but there is, and I'm not saying this is what you're doing, but, you know, there is certainly um, a pitfall we can fall into called martyrdom. Mm 
where our sense of ego is based on how much can I give up? <laughs> there is no parameter of poverty, right? I mean, you know, there's, we can use that sort of selflessness, which is not a sort of a pure selflessness, as a way to shore up the self, as a way to build up our ego and create a picture. And other people will say, oh, isn't she selfless? You know, isn't she a saint? Isn't he, you know, a great bodhisattva because he gives and gives and gives and, you know, he hasn't eaten in three days. And <laughs> he never goes home and he's at the Zen Center all the time. And I mean, you know, we see this happen in Dharma Centers as well as in other places. That kind of stuff is based on ego. That's not pure bodhisattva activity. So then, if we're injuring the body, I haven't eaten, I haven't slept in three days, I have to look at, why am I doing that? <laughs> you know, is it so people will think I'm hot stuff? Is there not somebody else in the office or the sangha or the home that can help? I mean, you know, why are we doing that? Intention. Chaitana, right? Eh? Thank you. Sure. Iris. It's just a little comment on that. I feel like it, that um, creates, um, when, you, when you have to leave some situation, it creates an interesting time for practice for like, you can leave, maybe it's helpful, but do you also have um, hatred at the time or do you also have anger? Um, and feel righteous that like, well, I need to get away from you because you're awful and mm -hmm. gross and I am amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I'm better than this. So. Well, and that's where we have an opportunity to watch. Here's hatred arising. I'm going to say something in anger. I'm maybe going to take some violent action. Okay, before I do that with the body, maybe I have to walk away. You know, here's a good example. Can we stop that unwholesome chain? You know, maybe that's the point where we have to leave the room and say, we'll have this conversation later when we're both able to kind of be more stable about this, but right now is not that time. <laughs> and we do have to watch what's arising here, you know, and it can, it, and sometimes it is, I have to leave you because I'm so much better than you that I just can't tolerate you. <laughs> you know, there's toxic, there are toxic situations in our lives, there's no question, you know, sometimes we have to walk away. But based on something, <laughs> based on what, Tony? It seems to me uh, part of the difficulty here goes back to um, your description of you know it's one, you know one, one piece, everything in one piece, mm -hmm. and basically our minds can't handle it. We can't grasp that. <laughs> we can't get around that. But it's human nature to try to, and we have to live it. That's what we did. It's for real, but we can't. Uh, and so then, as you described from your own experience, looking for the one theory that encompasses one everything. One true way. Right. There's that urge. Nobody will ever find it. But uh, related to that, or as a spin on it, is, well, if I can't find the one theory that um, explains everything to my satisfaction, I'll try to find one attitude which I can, because it's easier to remember, right? one attitude which will carry me through most, if not all, uh, circumstances that come up. Um, and that's where I tended to, over time, you know, fall or get into, well, that you don't find that either. But um, uh, in listening to what came up were various teachers making various remarks about this. In, in terms of the world is, you know, too big to really handle, but here we are. Uh, a mistaken stance, they all agree that the mistaken stance is dualism, as you said, it's the, the split. There's me and then there's the world, or there's me and the other person. And, there, and that's basic, that seems to be repeated everywhere as a basic rule, watch out for that, without unfortunately saying, well, here's how to fix that. But this is just something to watch out for, so the dualism. In the case of uh, uh, no hope, I have no hope, I have no fears, I'm free. Mm -hmm. That's also the, uh, uh, what have you ever seen? It's on the gravestone of uh, some writer <laughs> in America. But anyway, so that's one, one thing. So basically it's hard, and a, a major thing is, according to Kagira Roshi, uh, you know, somebody would go off somewhere and say, well, there's an example of dualism, which is uh, which is a is to somehow avoid that. Well, when you're talking about reparation or you know making amends for something, and you know what can you do? Da, da, da. 
the, an important thing to remember is you are already part of everything, just as you are. Not because I say so or anything, but, <laughs> but the tendency is because you did this pretty nasty thing, uh, you know, at some point in your life, really nasty. Uh, the tendency is, you know, mm, I'm back here, I got Without being able to give you an answer, uh, 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 an encouragement is that that's right, but you never were, you're not now, and you never will be separate. So the other thing that Suzuki Roshi used to hammer on was acceptance. Mm -hmm. And he said that was, he hit on that over and over. He said it many times in many different ways. Acceptance, not 100%, 110%. So that would, in a sense, for me, that helps relieve those kinds of situations. This person I'm trying to work with is treating me like, heck, it's toxic. A, accept it as it is. B, accept it because I'm getting out of here. You know, and I, you don't have to have the perfect answer. You know, it's, for me, acceptance, you know, courtesy of Suzuki Roshi and, and, and this non-duality, it's hard to keep. But when you remember it, 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 it sort of, it's as close as I've gotten to a, a generalized. So you can say, yes, this is terrible. Yes, racism is terrible. Yes, I want to care. Yes, but I'm not doing enough. Yes, I should do more. Yes, <laughs> but not necessarily yes. <laughs> anyway, that's what I've run into along these lines. Give it your children, children or if there's one attitude we can adopt, and I think probably pretty unfailingly in our practice, it's this attitude of inquiry. Inquiry requires us to be open. Inquiry requires us not to be rigid. Whatever's coming into our lives, we can look at that with some wisdom and compassion. We don't have to think it's an optimal circumstance. We may choose to take some action to change whatever that is, but job one is see it clearly. Job one is show up for our lives. You know, don't, don't hide from ourselves, don't hide from things. See it clearly. On that basis, make some choice about our conduct, make some choice about our action. So if, if we can adopt one sort of permanent attitude, <laughs> perhaps it's inquiry, because inquiry itself is not fixed. Right? So if we can approach everything with that kind of attitude, that's very helpful. That takes some courage, right? Because there's an awful lot of stuff we don't want to let in. You know, I don't want to see this or that. I don't want to acknowledge that this or that exists. So that takes some real courage. You know, that takes some real standing up straight and making a commitment to our lives to just approach everything with a spirit of inquiry. What is this about? What's happening here? And secondarily, you know, what action, if any, do I need to, do I need to take? Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, you know, in, in the work I've done uh, editing uh, Sun's translations of Dogen. And I, I've been struck so many times at how often Dogen is saying things like, we should investigate, we should examine, we should study. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. constantly. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like a refrain everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's really basic. Well, I think so, because we can be presented with some kind of teaching, and when Dogen says we should really examine this deeply, I think part of what he's saying is don't just take this don't just take these words that I've given you. Figure out what's really happening here. Um, and don't even accept that it's a good thing just because maybe I said so. But deeply investigate what this is. You know, Don't just uh, kind of take this and, 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 and practice with it, but really become intimate with it. You know, Really watch what's arising here. Really watch what this is about. Have some spirit of inquiry with it. I think you're exactly right. I think he encourages us, uh, encourages us to approach everything like that, which is which is a very helpful approach, I think. Somebody tell me what time it is, because I've probably kept you way too long. It's 11.32. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I think probably everybody wants some tea, and if we need to keep talking, we can do that during tea time. <laughs> I am so sorry, but thank you for a very, very interesting discussion. <laughs>